Hello, today we will be growing piezoelectric crystals of Rochelle salt. Now this is interesting because that means if we were to give the crystal a sharp tap with something, then it could generate electricity. So uh, Rochelle salt is potassium sodium tartrate. And so what we're going to use is cream of tartar, uh, some sodium carbonate, which I made in my last video, and you could check it out to see how you make it. But basically, you make it from baking soda by heating it up. So yeah, you'll need some of that. Uh, you'll need some sort of container, a scale to weigh out the cream of tartar. You'll need uh, some water. And you'll need uh, some sort of paper filter. Here I just got tissue. Don't need too, too good a filter for this. So, what you first got to do is you got to create the Rochelle salt from these ingredients. So basically what we're going to do, we're going to mix cream of tartar, which is potassium bitartrate, with sodium carbonate, which is a base. So uh, ideally we should have 44 grams of cream of tartar, or potassium bitartrate, and 100 milliliters of water. But this stuff is pretty expensive. This is uh, 42 grams and it costs $3. So I'm going to scale down by 5. And so here I got 20 milliliters of water instead of 100. And so that will mean we will need about 9 grams of this stuff. So I'm going to weigh out 9 grams. Okay, that's 9 right there. So right now I'm uh, putting it into the water. Yeah, I'll be back once I slowly put it all in. Okay, I'm back and I got the cream of tartar in, which is potassium bitartrate. Just gonna shake it up. And you see that it's not very soluble. But once we react it with the sodium carbonate, more and more should dissolve. So here's the sodium carbonate, and basically what you could do is you could drop tiny bits in and what's gonna happen there should be bubbles you're gonna wait for the bubbling to stop and then once it's stopped you're gonna add in another pinch of sodium carbonate and then it's gonna bubble again right and then you wait for those bubbles to stop and so on until despite adding in more sodium carbonate the bubbles stop coming out altogether which means that the reaction is completed so it's been a very long while and as you can see the solutions turned clear so, what I've been doing all this time is adding pinches of this sodium carbonate into the solution. And basically what happens is an acid-base reaction, and the carbonate turns into water and carbon dioxide, which bubbles off. So yeah, there's still a bit of particles in here, but that should be filtered off. And if your bubbles are all gone and the acid's been neutralized, and yet you still have a slightly milky water, it just might mean that your water is too cold and you just need to wait for it to warm up to room temperature. And otherwise, you could just filter the particles out. Another reason why it might be milky is that uh, it's been so long that part of the water's evaporated, and so there's less solvent to dissolve the solute. In either case, it's okay, because you're just going to filter off the suspended crystals. So here I have tissue paper and a container beneath. Just gonna one thing I begin, uh, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is goggles and gloves safety. These chemicals should be pretty safe, so I don't think you'll need goggles or gloves, but you should do it to be safe. So you should wear goggles and gloves just to be safe. So basically, what happened during the reaction was an acid-base reaction, and acid and base neutralized each other. So what happened was the uh, cream of tartar or potassium bitartrate donated hydrogen ions to the sodium carbonate which is a base and the carbonate ions and the hydrogen ions react to form water and carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide is the bubbles that you see and this leaves sodium ions potassium ions and tartrate ions in the solution which I have written as potassium sodium tartrate and that is the Rochelle salt that we are after okay now the solutions done filtering and I'm just going to take off the filter. And as you can see we here have the dish which is now full of the 
solution. So now you're just going to have to wait for the water to slowly evaporate and the Rochelle salt to crystallize. So you should get another uh, paper and cover it up to avoid getting dust into the solution. So you, you should check in from time to time, but you have to be patient for the crystals to crystallize. So I'll see you in a long while. So it's been about four days and you can see that there are some small crystals of Rochelle salt growing. It is interesting to note that in the beginning, due to the amount of uh, cream of tartar we used to prepare the solution, this solution should have been already super saturated, meaning that it already holds more solute than it could contain, and that solute in this case is Rochelle salt. So theoretically, that Rochelle salt should have crystallized at the beginning. However, it did not crystallize until four days later, and it also rapidly crystallized. In fact, this morning I checked it and there were no crystals at all. And here I am in the afternoon and suddenly these crystals spring out of nowhere. So the reason for this is that uh, the solution takes a long time to nucleate, which means to form tiny starter crystals from the solution. And after these starter crystals are formed, the, the crystals can grow much faster because these starter crystals provide a surface area for the solution to deposit more solute on. And so the crystals will rapidly grow after uh, the starter crystals are formed. So that means if we added some starter crystals to the solution all the way at the beginning, we could speed up the process of crystal growth. And I'll be demonstrating that later in the video. So I left the solution to crystallize overnight, and here I am in the morning. And let's see what we got. So, this is pretty cool, huh? So, as you can see, a lot of new crystals have formed, and the old ones before have grown bigger. So, it's been a week since I first made the solution, and let's see what we got below. So, the crystals have grown a lot since, and you can also see that they're very crowded. If you recognize some of these crystals from the previous clips, you can see that they're uh, in different locations now because that I jostled them around a little to make sure they're f ready to filter. So, uh, when should you harvest these? Well, you should probably harvest these when uh, crowding occurs. So right now you can see it's very crowded. Um, you can reduce crowding by picking out the crystals by hand, but that is very tedious. So I prefer to harvest them all at once, and now is a pretty good time to harvest. So I'll show you how to harvest the crystals. So to harvest the crystals, what we're going to do is we're going to filter them from the solution. So before we do that, we need to make sure the crystals are loose and not stuck to the container. So I could just jostle this around, and most of them are free. I'll just pick off the ones that are stuck later. So uh, here I have another container to filter into. I've got some tissue paper to filter with. So we got the solution all filtered, and you can see that here we have the solution. And you're going to want to keep that because you might want to use it to grow more crystals later on. So I actually managed to get most of the crystals to not be filtered. So they basically just remained in this cup. Uh, the crystals that did go with the flow and got filtered are on this paper. So uh, next you want something to lay the crystals out on to dry. Here I got a sheet of notebook paper. And just put it down. So I'm gonna uh, first I'm gonna dump out the crystals in the cup that didn't get filtered onto the paper. Next, you're gonna want to also shake off the crystals that are on the filter. So one just dropped off. Get the other ones off. So now that you've got all the crystals out, you will want to dry them. So here I have a paper towel that I'm just going to lay on top of them, gently push down on it. 
make sure it touches them. And now you wait. So it's been some time, and I think uh, most of the crystals are dry now. So if you lift this up, it'll just scrape off any crystals that are stuck on it. Yeah, okay, I think I got most of them. So, yeah. Here are the crystals. Uh, you can see this is a pretty well formed one. This has little defects. Uh, this is another large one. So, besides these good crystals, you also have a bunch of crystals that are all stuck together. And if you can, you could try to uh, separate them a little by hand. But most of them are actually grown into each other and they're actually like part of each other. So you can't actually separate them. So those, uh, you can find a use for them by redissolving them and recrystallizing them to create better crystals. So I picked out some of the well-formed crystals and I put them here. So I was handling these without gloves and these crystals shouldn't be dangerous but to be safe you can wear gloves if you want. Anyways, so this is the other pile of all the crystals that are grown together. And I actually managed to get some of these crystals by uh, carefully and gently breaking apart a clump. And so uh, this one here had a crystal other it had another crystal in it so I had to break it off and you can't really see it on camera but there's a tiny pit in here where, and that pit was where the crystal was once in and I once I broke that crystal off it just left a pit in here but that demonstrates that you can indeed break off crystals to uh, get get well shaped crystals so yeah the crystallization of that solution took a really long time because uh, the solution took time to nucleate and form starter crystals. But that means we can speed it up by adding in the starter crystals ourselves. So uh, basically you're going to have to drop these crystals into a saturated or super saturated solution of Rosal salt. Uh, saturated means that it's already holding, it's already dissolving as much Rosal salt as it can and super saturated means it's dissolving more of a shell salt than it actually can, and w which means it will have to uh, precipitate out some of that Rochelle shell salt. Anyways, um, so to create this these solutions, you have a number of options. You could use the method described all the way at the beginning of the video to create the initial solution, and that will result in a slightly super saturated solution. Uh, you could use the solution that we filtered off, so that was the excess solution that we didn't need, or you can use a uh, some of these uh, rejected crystals that aren't well formed and dissolve them to create a saturated solution. You can use these to create a super saturated solution and super saturated solutions grow crystals faster but they're also harder to make. So I'll just stick with a saturated solution. Here I have five milliliters of water and basically we're gonna dissolve the Rochelle salt in until none will dissolve. So here I have the saturated solution, and so now it's dissolving as much Rochelle salt as it possibly can, and so even if I add in more Rochelle salt, none will dissolve. So there we go, we have a saturated solution. So next, we should probably filter it to get rid of all the dust that's accumulated. So I'm just going to filter it, and so it should just be about done filtering, so I'll just remove the filter. And there we go, we have our filtered saturated solution. So next you're going to want to choose a seed crystal to put in. Uh, you should ideally have a crystal that's not too thick and pretty wide. So uh, something like this or oops, this one should be good, but they're too big. I'll choose a smaller one. This, this one, really hard to see actually, so I'll just drop it in. So now I'll just wait for it to evaporate, and when the solution evaporates, it should deposit the excess Rochelle salt onto the crystal and make it grow larger. And so I'll leave this overnight. Uh, so here I am in the morning, and you can see that the sea crystal has grown a lot. I'm not sure that you were able to see it on the camera, but the sea crystal was originally about this size, and now it's this size, so that's pretty impressive. Uh, you can speed up the 
growth process by having a wider container which will let the evaporation go faster but I'll just leave it here for another while so here I am in the evening and I think the crystal is ready to be harvested so I'm just gonna take this wire loop and try to scoop it out of there and oops here we go and that's another crystal to add to our collection first I'm gonna dry off with a tissue make sure no uh, crystal residues form at the surface dry off and there we go it's another beautiful crystal to add to our collection so yeah so th this is how you grow the piezoelectric crystals using seed crystals which speeds up the process so now that we've covered making the crystals I'm going to show you how to test them so uh, here I have the crystal we just made from the seed crystal and so I'm going to show you how to test for the piezoelectricity so like I explained uh, the piezoelectricity occurs when you put mechanical stress onto the crystal which causes it to generate some sort of voltage so you could see that if you compress it it would generate some voltage but once you release it it will uncompress and generate the reverse voltage so in theory it should be some sort of alternating current but I've seen a uh, People do this with uh, skill scopes, which map out the voltage, and it's very erratic and random. And uh, it's, yeah, so it's very random alternating current. And so I'm not sure uh, the alternating function on this digital multimeter will be able to pick it up. So I'm actually going to test with DC voltage. And so this is going to be a very crude test. It's not going to give you any good information. It's just going to prove that there is piezoelectricity occurring. So let's get on with it. Uh, so you'll need that digit, digital multimeter and you cannot use an analog multimeter because they are not sensitive enough and believe me I have tried but the digital multimeter should be sensitive enough so actually you find two opposite uh, sides on the crystal but they don't need to be actual like sides they could be just general sides that uh, encompass multiple f facets but so you should make sure the sides are very close so you shouldn't choose the top and bottom of the top side and bottom side here. Choose the top side here and the bottom side here because they're very close and that should generate a better reading. So I've set up uh, the probes here with aluminum foil connecting them to the crystal. So since this is so sensitive, I want to make sure that there's no misreadings. And so. Uh, the aluminum foil should dissipate any mechanical shock before it reaches the probes. So, uh, I have the crystal on one probe and the crystal the other probes touching it now with no short circuit. Now I'm just going to press down on the crystal and see what happens. So right now it's generating a negative voltage. Now it's going positive. It's rising. I'm just like pumping mechanical stress into the crystal. It's going up and it's sort of at 50 millivolts and that's pretty cool actually. So we stop that. 70. Now that we got the voltage, what about the current? Well the current is very very low. So this is in microamps I believe. I'm doing the same pumping action into the crystal which should generate mechanical stress but even in a microamp range, it generates nothing. So, sort of like capacitors, the same way they generate, they could store very little charge, even with this sort of distance between them, between two capacitor plates, it would store very little charge. So, sort of same principle here. And so, these crystals can't be really used for generating electricity. So, yeah. But, cool thing they could be used for is the reverse piezoelectric effect when you apply alternating current to the crystal they should resonate at frequencies and create sound so that's pretty cool so uh, in the future I want to use these for things like loudspeakers and other things that involve sound and the coolest thing I want to make with them is probably going to be a uh, ultrasonic sonicator to be used in graphene experiments but that's going to be very hard to make, and I'm not sure if I can make it, but I'll try and see what happens. So this has been a very cool experiment, making these crystals. I think they're pretty cool, and thanks for watching.